Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, I'm very happy to have with us Professor Christine Lay. Christine did her master's and PhD at the University of Toronto, working first with Professor V. Dong and later with Professor Mark Lawtons, where she investigated novel approaches to carbofunctionalization of alkynes. Subsequently, she carried out postdoctoral work in the group of Professor Dean Tost at the University of California, Berkeley, and in 2019, she started her independent career at the University of New Mexico. She now works as a professor at York University, and today she's going to be telling us about some of her work in the area of carbofunctionalization. And with that, I'll go ahead and let you get started. Thank you very much for joining us today, Christine. Thanks so much for the invitation, Matt. I'd like to take this opportunity to share some of the work that I did during my PhD at the University of Toronto. The Lawton's group has a long-standing interest in developing new cross-coupling reactions initiated by HEC-type carbopalidation processes. Before getting into the details of my PhD work, I'd like to first discuss the general catalytic cycle of the HEC reaction and highlight some key catalytic intermediates. The first step of the reaction involves oxidative addition of the palladium zero catalyst into the organohalide bond followed by olefin coordination and migratory insertion to generate a palladium-2 alkyl halide intermediate. Now, under standard HEC conditions, this intermediate is primed to undergo a beta hydride elimination to form the final cross-coupled product. Now, this beta hydride elimination is generally very fast. However, we can engineer the system such that the beta hydride elimination pathway is diverted. One strategy involves blocking the beta site with additional substituents. Thus, in the absence of beta hydrogens, this intermediate can be trapped by an exogenous nucleophile to give a difunctionalized product. A wide range of nucleophiles can be applied in this olefin difunctionalization, commonly referred to as an anion capture cascade, and this area is very well established. However, another intriguing mechanistic possibility could arise from this common species, which would be direct carbon halogen bond productive elimination. Overall, this carbohalogenation reaction would lead to the formation of two new bonds across the olefin, while leaving the reactive halogen functionality intact in the final product. So why is this reaction even interesting? Well, carbon-halogen bond reductive elimination from palladium-2 complexes is actually a rare elementary process, especially when using conventional ligands such as triaryl phosphines. If you think about it this way, oxidative addition into a carbon-halogen bond constitutes the first step of many palladium-catalyzed cross-couplings and is generally considered to be thermodynamically favorable. Therefore, it should follow that the microscopic reverse that is, the reductive elimination of carbon-halogen bonds from palladium, should be energetically uphill. And this is particularly true for reactions where a carbon sp3 halogen bond is formed. In 2011, Lawtons and Newman found that the key to promoting this seemingly unfavorable reaction involves a strategic choice of substrate paired with a bulky monodentate phosphine ligand, namely QFOS. In this reaction, oxidative addition into the aryl halide bond, followed by intramolecular carbopalidation, generates a neopental palladium species, which cannot undergo beta hydride elimination. In the presence of QFOS, carbon iodine bond reductive elimination occurs to generate these cycloisomerized products. There are, however, limitations to this chemistry. In general, aryl bromides showed poor reactivity under these conditions only leading to trace amounts of the product, while aryl chlorides were completely unreactive. In addition, no successful alkyne carbohalogenation reaction had been developed at this point in time, and this was a challenge I wanted to tackle during my PhD. In this proposed reaction, carbon halogen bond reductive elimination would occur from a vinyl palladium species, and in theory, this step should be much more favorable than the analogous reductive elimination process from an sp3 carbon center. While this reaction may look simple on paper, there are several issues to consider. In the reaction, we are transforming an aryl halide into a vinyl halide, which is also susceptible to oxidative addition, and so we may run into issues of product inhibition, which can lead to poor catalyst turnover, catalyst death, or it could initiate potential product decomposition pathways. 
A key finding in our early investigations was that the steric bulk of the alkynyl substituent was equally as important as the phosphine ligand in promoting reactivity. In the end, we found that this TIPS substituted alkyne gave us the best results, enabling the reaction to be conducted under quite mild conditions, whereas less hindered alkynes required elevated temperatures and longer reaction times. It should be noted that in addition to the expected cis addition product, we also observed a small amount of the geometric isomer, the trans addict. Now, we believe that this isomer is formed via palladium-catalyzed olefin isomerization process, and I'll show you some experimental and computational evidence to support this in a moment. Overall, the effect of the bulky alkynyl substituent is twofold. The first is to promote the carbon-halogen bond reductive elimination step by increasing steric bulk close to the palladium center, and the second is to increase the stability of the product in the solution. Since the product of the reaction is a vinyl halide that is also susceptible to reinsertion with the palladium catalyst, one can imagine that this insertion pathway could lead to product inhibition, attenuation in turnover numbers, or it could initiate unwanted side reactions. However, with a bulky TIPS group, even if the palladium catalyst reinserts, the catalyst becomes too sterically congested to react with anything else in solution. Here are some selected examples from the substrate scope, which shows that both aryl iodides and aryl chlorides can be applied in this chemistry. We can also change the nature of the alkyne tether and in limited instances, the terminal alkyne substituent, provided that steric bulk is sufficiently maintained. So to gain insight into the mechanism for olefin isomerization, we conducted some experiments where we subjected isomerically pure samples of the cis and trans products back to the reaction conditions. In both cases, a 92 to 8 cis-trans mixture was produced, which is consistent with the ratio observed when starting directly from the linear substrate. In the absence of the palladium catalyst, no isomerization is observed, which demonstrates that the isomerization is indeed palladium catalyzed and that oxidative addition is reversible in our system. Under all conditions, the cis isomer was the major product. The reason why I want to highlight this is because in a later story that I will be sharing, we demonstrate that we can access the trans isomer exclusively. So for this reaction, our proposed mechanism begins with oxidative addition into the aryl halide bond, which is followed by cis carbopallidation to generate vinyl palladium complex A. Carbon halogen bond reductive elimination from this species would generate the cis isomer as expected. In order to form the trans isomer, this would necessitate the formation of the isomeric vinyl palladium complex B through an isomerization pathway. Reductive elimination from intermediate B would then give the trans isomer. So how does this isomerization occur? In the literature, Zwitter ionic palladium carbonoid species have been proposed, represented here using two resonance forms, where the formal charges are located on opposite atoms. In either case, free rotation about the carbon-carbon bond is allowed. To gain insight into the mechanism of this reaction, we collaborated with the Schoenenbeck group to run some DFT calculations in our system. I should mention that we worked with them on several projects and that any computations you see throughout the talk were conducted by Teresa Sperger, a PhD student at that time in the Schoenenbeck lab. What they have found was that during the transition state for isomerization, there is not a significant amount of charge separation, and that any charge that is built up is more or less distributed across several atoms in the molecule. In other words, these Zwitteronic species on the right here represent extreme resonance forms. In the isomerization transition state, there is concomitant shortening of the palladium C1 and the RC1 bonds, while the C1-C2 bond lengthens, which allows free rotation about that carbon-carbon bond. So during the development of this alkyne carbohalogenation reaction, we noticed that aryl halides that had an amide linker were not suitable substrates for this reaction, giving very low conversions and only trace amounts of products at best. We were particularly determined to access this class of molecules due to its relevance in pharmaceutical drugs, as well as intermediates in the synthesis of natural product scaffolds. Ultimately, we envisioned accessing this motif 
through an alternative disconnection involving a carbamoyl chloride precursor instead, oxidative addition into the carbamoyl chloride bond, followed by alkyne insertion and reductive elimination, would yield the same methylene oxindol product, but with perhaps different stereochemistry. So we began our optimization by testing our standard carbohalogenation catalyst in the chlorocarbamoylation reaction. Both palladium q and palladium triterpedyl phosphine gave poor conversion, but we were encouraged to find the formation of some product in the reaction. In both cases, the E isomer was observed as the exclusive product, which would have to arise from a trans addition process. More on this later. Interestingly, when we switched to a less bulky ligand, we observed a drastic increase in reactivity with nearly full conversion and 86% yield of the product. Based on the success of the diterbutyl phenylphosphine ligand, I was prompted to test a phosphoadamantine ligand, which is similarly bulky but slightly more electron deficient due to the oxygens embedded within the adamantine cage. This ligand gave full conversion of the starting material and nearly quantitative yields of the desired product. We synthesized other phosphoadamantine derivatives as well, which proved to be similarly effective, so we stuck with the commercially available ligand. Unfortunately, I will not have time to discuss the scope of this reaction, but I will mention that exclusive transselectivity was observed in all cases, and that having a TIPS group at that terminal alkyne position was crucial for reactivity. To account for the exclusive transselectivity observed, we have proposed two possible mechanisms both of which begin with oxidative addition of the palladium zero catalyst into the carbamoyl chloride bond. In pathway A, an in situ generated chloride ion from another molecule of the starting material could trap intermediate 1 via a transchloropalidation process, which upon CC bond reductive elimination would give the trans isomer. To test the feasibility of an ionic pathway, we conducted the reaction in the presence of exogenous halide additives, potassium or sodium iodide. In both cases, the starting material was fully converted to chloromethylene oxindol, with no halide exchange products observed in the crude proton MR, thus disfavoring this pathway. Alternatively, in pathway B, complex 1 can undergo an initial cis carbopalidation of the alkyne to generate intermediate 2 which likely experiences unfavorable steric interactions between the bulky tips group and the aromatic backbone. In order to relieve this steric congestion, this vinyl palladium complex can undergo cis-trans isomerization to give intermediate 3, which upon carbon-chlorine bond reductive elimination provides a trans addict. Now it is possible that direct reductive elimination could occur from 2 to give the cis addict, which can then undergo the isomerization pathway. But when we monitored this reaction by in situ NMR, we did not observe the formation of the product on the time scale of the NMR experiment, suggesting that isomerization is more favored than direct carbon halogen bond reductive elimination. So to gain further insight, we collaborated with the Schoenenbeck group to carry out computational studies of the cis-trans isomerization pathway from intermediate 2, which is this cis-vinyl palladium intermediate, which forms immediately after carbopalidation, we have two possible pathways, direct reductive elimination to form the cis isomer, or isomerization. The isomerization was found to be facile, and hence significantly favored over direct reductive elimination. Overall, isomerization followed by reductive elimination from 3 was calculated to be kinetically and thermodynamically favored, which is why we do not observe the cis isomer at all. As alluded to previously, having a TIPS group at the terminal alkyne position was crucial for reactivity, and as you can see, as we decrease the steric bulk of that substituent, we see a complete drop in yield. We were particularly interested in accessing the phenyl-substituted chloromethylene oxindole due to its prevalence in medicinal chemistry. At this point, I wondered if I could access the same molecule by simply switching from the palladium zero catalyst to a palladium two catalyst and invoking a different mechanistic course. So instead of activating the carbamoyl chloride first, the electrophilic palladium chloride catalyst can coordinate to the alkyne and undergo a trans or cis chloropalidation process, 
At this point, a nucleophilic vinyl palladium species is generated, which can then activate the carbamoyl chloride through a CC bond forming process to give the product. This last step could potentially proceed through a palladium 2 intermediate or via a high valent palladium 4 intermediate. So indeed our hypothesis was correct, and so here are the optimized conditions, which employs 5 mol percent of the bis benzonitrile palladium chloride catalyst. The major product in this reaction was the desired methylene oxindole, which was formed with greater than 95 to 5 selectivity for the cis isomer. The minor product was this six-membered quinolinone, which you can imagine forming via a chloropallidation with the reverse regioselectivity. Lucky for us, we could separate these products by column chromatography. Here are some selected examples from our substrate scope, which show that aryl, heteroaryl, and alkyl groups were all tolerated at the terminal position, thus greatly expanding the utility of this method. More importantly, we are able to functionalize the vinyl chloride moiety with a variety of nucleophiles, providing access to some medicinally relevant scaffolds. A general catalytic cycle for this reaction begins with coordination of the substrate to the electrophilic palladium catalyst, which is accompanied by loss of one benzonitrile ligand to generate an eta 2 alkyne complex 1. From this key intermediate, several stereo and regiochemical outcomes are possible for the alkyne chloropallidation step, the selectivity of which determines the final product distribution. In the alpha addition pathway, palladium inserts proximal to the carbamoyl chloride moiety, and this process can occur with cis or trans selectivity. Regardless of the stereoselectivity of this chloropallidation step, a nucleophilic vinyl palladium species is generated, which can then undergo intramolecular cross-coupling with the carbamoyl chloride to furnish the methylene oxindole product. Two plausible mechanisms can be proposed for this CC bond forming step. Path A involves carbopallidation onto the carbonyl moiety to generate a palladium 2 alkoxide species, which upon beta chloride elimination furnishes the product and regenerates the divalent catalyst. Alternatively, path B involves the formation of a high valent palladium 4 intermediate via oxidative addition into the carbamoyl chloride bond. The desired product is then formed upon CC bond reductive elimination. In the beta trans chloropallidation pathway, intermediate 1B is formed. This would also generate a nucleophilic vinyl palladium species, which can then undergo intramolecular cross coupling via path A or B to give the six membered ring product. So, to investigate the nature of the final CC bond forming step, we studied the possible pathways computationally. The redox neutral palladium 2 catalyzed 1 2 addition pathway was calculated to be much higher in energy than the alternative pathway involving oxidative addition to generate a high valent palladium 4 intermediate. Specifically, this oxidative addition pathway was found to be 11 kcals per mole more favored. This was a particularly unusual finding as it is quite rare to see high valent palladium 4 species being generated under such mild conditions. Finally, from intermediate 2b, the CC bond reductive elimination step was shown to be quite facile, with a barrier of 14.7 kcals per mole. So to conclude, we developed the first catalytic vinyl halide synthesis via the cycloisomerization of alkyne-tethered aryl halides. In this study, we found that in addition to having a bulky ligand, the steric bulk of the alkynyl group is just as important. We then studied carbamoyl chlorides as an alternative coupling partner in the development of an alkyne chlorocarbamoylation reaction, which featured the use of an interesting class of caged phosphoadamantine ligands, but was limited to bulky alkynes. So in order to expand the scope of the chlorocarbamoylation reaction, we explored alternative modes of activation using palladium-2 catalysis, the products of which could be easily derivatized to pharmaceutically relevant scaffolds. Lastly, computational studies in collaboration with the Schoenenbeck group have shed insight into the influence of substrate and catalyst on both reactivity and stereoselectivity. And with that, I would like to thank my PhD supervisor, Professor Mark Lawtons at the University of Toronto, our collaborator, Professor Francisca Schoenenbeck at Aachen University. I'd also like to thank 
my wonderful co-workers that I had the privilege of working with throughout the years on these projects, the funding agencies for supporting these projects, a special thank you to Dr. Matthew Horowitz for this opportunity, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you for tuning in for another Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Christine for sharing her work with us today. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. To support this initiative, help us out by telling your peers about this resource. Check our webpage, synthesis-workshop.com, and follow us on Twitter to stay up to date. See you all next time.